Welcome to the Lazy CEO Podcast, where Jim Schlexer, author of Great CEOs Are Lazy and founder of the CEO Project, features compelling experts and topics for CEOs of mid to large size companies. Now, let's get started with the show. This podcast is brought to you by the CEO Project. At the CEO Project, we work with CEOs to help them grow their business. Uh, and our members represent billions of dollars of revenue and profit. And frankly, amongst all of us, we've probably made every mistake in the book, including some you haven't made yet. So if you want to learn from the experience of a bunch of really seasoned CEOs, we're a great place to hang out. In this podcast, what you're going to hear are some of those ideas, concepts, and things that are just going to help you on your journey. If you want to find out more, reach out to us at theceoproject.com, or you can contact me personally at jim at theceoproject.com. Happy listening. Welcome, everybody, to the Lazy CEO Podcast. Um, we have a great guest today. We have Joel Trammell, somebody I've known for years. Uh, Joel is a serial entrepreneur. He's had successes and failures and crazy stories. Um, and is now um, mostly helping other CEOs become even better CEOs than they, they are when they show up in front of them, which is very aligned to our mission. Um, he started out as a nuclear submariner um, and uh, quickly figured out that he wanted to become an entrepreneur and has a series of businesses. If you looked at his LinkedIn, I think he has you know, 20 or 30 experiences. So an incredible depth of exposure and in investing and building companies and selling companies and and generally running really excellent companies as well. And hopefully Joel's going to share some of what he's learned over time. So welcome, Joel. Really appreciate having you. Oh, great to be with you. Always good to talk to you, Jim. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're going to have some fun. So appreciate it. Um, so let's just start with, let's just start with what are you doing now? I talked a little bit about helping CEOs in education. Well, why don't you just talk a little bit about what you're doing now? And then we'll dig into some topics after we get that out. Sure. Uh, you know, I spend most of my time these days trying, like you said, trying to help CEOs. Uh, you know, what really frustrated me in my career was seeing businesses that should be home runs that turn into singles or strikeouts because leadership just isn't uh, have the capabilities to, to drive to the outcome. So, so I, you know, I kind of tell people I'm looking for CEOs wanting to hit the home run. Um, and, you know, I've been fortunate enough in my career to do that a few times. Uh, and I think I've learned something about doing it. And it and, and most people can, can easily make the transition, I think, uh, if they had the skills necessary to get the business going and be successful, they have the skills necessary to be CEO. They just don't always know exactly what to do. So I spend a lot of time training CEOs and their management teams on how you implement a, a system to run the organization better. Interesting. And I think a lot of them are missing just that, a system, right? They just, they don't have, they sort of do stuff is the mentality, but they don't know what stuff to do. So how do you get them from do stuff to exactly what they should be working on? Obviously, we use theory of constraints at the CEO project and the five hats, and which I know you've adapted. But what do you, what's the model that you use to help them focus? Yeah, I find myself most of the time going back to what I call uh, two uh, triangles of tension that I've found that kind of exist in every business. Uh, the first one, kind of obvious to a lot of people, you have tension between the wants and needs of employees, the wants and needs of customers, and the wants and needs of shareholders. And, mm -hmm. you know, my view is that to build a sustainable business, you have to keep all those interests, you know, aligned as best you can. You're going to make trade-offs, but you're always balancing. And I always tell my executive team, when we have a big decision to make, let's stop a second. Let's put on the employee's hat as a group. Think about how it's going to impact employees. Let's put on the customer hat as a group. Let's put on the shareholder hat as a group. And so that's kind of the external tension that every CEO has to manage. And then internal to almost every business I've ever seen is a tension between the sales group, the, that, product, the, that? the product group, and the, uh, the marketing group. And, uh, you know, that's an internal tension that has to be managed. And when you take a look at those kind of six fundamental areas, really the role of the CEO is managing the white space and communication and coordination of all six of those areas all at the same time. Right. Interesting. Which is really, your first book was called CEO Tightrope, which is sort of what you're right. implying here is that dynamic tension that you're managing all the time. Yep. Um, so how, how do you, 
okay, given the, the lens of the various stakeholders and their interests, which are not full, you know, when they're aligned, they're aligned. When they're not, they're not. How do you make the decision about which one has supremacy? In this case, who, which way am I going to go this time versus next time? Because, I, and, and here's why I'm asking, you know, my experience is people say, well, maybe I'm going to be a better CEO, I'll get an MBA. I'm like, that's not going to help. Because if it's black and white, you can figure it out. It's the gray stuff is where it's always hard, which is exactly what you're talking about. And they go, well, how do I decide in the gray stuff? And I go, well, that is not easy. That is not easy. So how do you, what do you give guidance in, the, in that area? Yeah, so I, I think the issue for a lot of people is they have a team that they grew up on, right? Maybe you're a, they grew up as a salesperson. And so your tendency very much is to balance uh, unhealthily towards sales because you see kind of the CEO job, it's just a big sales job. Or you grew up as a product person, you think everything, we just build a better product, they'll beat a path to our door kind of concept. And so I think it, it is about learning and thinking about being able to get in the shoes of those six different constituencies. And I, you know, I think most people just never stop and pause and think. They're so busy running the business and making decisions that they don't pause and think, hey, wait a minute, how are customers going to react to this you know, price increase? We need to do it. Okay, I understand prices have gone up, but is there a good way to do it or a bad way to do it? They don't think about that. They just justify, yeah, we got to do a price increase. And the line I use is I think people spend way too much time in business thinking about what they want to do and not near enough time thinking about how to execute it well. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I've always said um, I'd rather have a, a B-class plan with A-class execution than an A-class yeah. plan with B-class execution, right? It's the yes. same idea. Yes. So, so you know, given that you're trying to get people to take a multifaceted view of the business and you know, sort of sit in the shoes of each role, organizational structures, the way they're built, most companies don't encourage me to work outside my silo, right? If I'm running mm -hmm. engineering, my excellence should be in engineering or sales or marketing or accounting or whatever. So how do I build that muscle that allows me to step back and take a multifaceted view? Like the, the structure doesn't create those people organically. So how do you create them over time? And I'm really talking to the, you know, the entrepreneurs and leaders here who say, okay, got it, Joel. Sounds great. How do I create people that think like this? I mean, you'll say, send them to me would be one option, but there's probably <laughs> other options too, right? <laughs> well, I think it starts in the planning process. So, uh, you know, the, a lot of people do strategy and spend a lot of time thinking about uh, strategy, uh, but then boiling it down to what I, you know, think uh, is going to make a difference, which I have a one-page strategic plan that I teach everybody to produce, because if you can't produce it on one page, your employees aren't going to aren't going to do anything with it. And so that process involves getting down to strategic objectives. These are things that we're looking two, three years out. And I just simply go through the question, what is the most important thing we're doing for customers over the next two to three year period? What's the most important thing we're doing for shareholders over the next two to three? What's the most important thing we're doing for employees? And you, you ask those six questions, each area. And, and so that gives you balance. And then every time I set quarterly goals, I'm looking at those strategic objectives that are, again, balanced. And I'm saying, OK, this quarter over the next 90 day period, what's the most important thing we're doing for customers? And so it kind of forces the organization to look at things from that perspective. Then, of course, yeah, I want my sales guy to go sell stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but at least he understands the bigger picture and where he's going to tie into all the other responsibilities of the other groups. You know, we had a, a member uh, and she just forming an executive team. Shockingly, they never had one. It's a pretty good sized company. She brought them together and said, hey, let's figure out just that, right? Their longer term objectives and tremendously disappointed by the level of thinking of the people. Um, and it may be she has the wrong people, but but also they've never done this before, right? So right. Their, their competency is extremely low in that like strategic mm -hmm. conversation. So it feels to me like, Great questions, but it's still going to take you a year or two till people actually really start thinking like that and own it. And, and some will get there quicker than others. But, but, you know, how long have you seen it take from somebody to go to, to begin to think that way? Yeah, I, I tell people, I, I think, you know, building an executive team from scratch is a 12 to 18 month process. Yeah. It is not a hire the right people and suddenly magic happens. <laughs> uh, 
you know, it's just like a basketball team. You can have the best point guard and the best power forward, but if they never played together and they don't, you know, their games don't jive, it doesn't work. Uh, yeah. And so I think it's the same thing. I think 12 to 18 months is kind of the time frame you're looking at, unfortunately, uh, to build a, a solid executive team. Yeah. I, in fact, I talked to her the other day and I said, so you've had your second executive team meeting. It's good now, right? <laughs> you know, which obviously <laughs> not, right? We got another <laughs> yeah. year plus to go. And and That's some right. of them may not make it, right? Some, you know, what I've experienced is some people can never get out of their silo, right? You try to yeah. invite them to that conversation that you talked about. Let's think more broadly about the business. Let's think about stakeholders that are not you. And they 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 cannot take the glasses off of engineering or accounting or they can't elevate to that level. They just can't do it. And how do you handle when you've got somebody on the executive team that you're trying to elevate, you're trying to get them strategic, and they just continue to drop into their silo? You know, and, and sometimes accountants might be the most guilty of this or lawyers, or but they have a hard time pulling out. So how, how do you deal with that? Do you just not invite them or do you, how do you manage Well, that? I think it's, you know, it's kind of, a lot of people don't think about what really is an executive. OK, I mean, we give somebody a VP title. Does that make them an executive? You know, to me, the, the two things that I always said to be an executive for me. You have to pass two tests. You ha I have to be comfortable that you can represent the organization as a whole to external constituents mm -hmm. that I can put you out in front of whatever audience and you can represent the, the organization as a whole, not just the salesperson. And then the second uh, thing is that you can make decisions. That are or relevant to your part of the organization without messing up other parts of the organization without <laughs> with understanding how you fit into the bigger picture. And if you can't do those two things, you may can have a big salary and a big title, but you're not an executive. You can't play on the executive team. And so you, you limit who's going to be on the executive team. Title doesn't get you to the executive meeting. That's right. Competence, those things get you there, right? That's right. And I, I think it's important for a lot of your CEOs probably who are building teams, I go through the exercise of making people build out their org chart, but put their name in the box if they're a CEO, but you know, if they're really the executive for sales, if they really don't have somebody, maybe they've got somebody with a title, but they're not really performing that role, you need to put your name in as the VP of sales because you're really performing that function and it's important for the organization to kind of understand who the executive is in each area. Oh, only or and? And. <laughs> and. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I've done the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I do the same yeah. thing. Let, let's, let's call it, let's call it what it is. Right. That's right. That's right. Don't confuse the organization by having a VP of sales that can't make decisions for their area. You know? Well, the other way I've seen people use this is to go, I'm, I'm the VP of sales with a CEO title. So I can thump anybody I got to thump to get my, my agenda <laughs> driven. Right. Which is really unfair, you know, because how do you say no when the CEO is in front of you? You're, yeah. I need yeah. this tomorrow, right? Yeah, awesome. it's not ideal. You ought to replace all those VPs with somebody better than you at the job, but you need to reflect it if that's reality in your organization. So maybe a strategy, and then let's move over to hiring. So is strategic thinking teachable? You know, that's a that's a good question. I, you know, I've never been, you know, I wouldn't consider myself a strategy guy. Uh, per se, I had uh, in some of my organizations, I've had people on the team who formed that kind of chief strategy officer role. And and that was fine. Of course, uh, uh, one of my businesses I did with the, my wife and she was the brains of the operation and then generated the IP and product vision. So, you know, really, I was taking uh, what she gave me. Uh, so I don't know that the CEO has to be the strategy expert in the organization. Mm -hmm. They certainly have to own the strategy once it's created. Uh, but I think you can, you know, you can even conceivably have outside people who are providing a lot of input on the strategy. I, I think the tendency of a lot of CEOs is to, again, spend way too much time on the strategy and not near enough time on how we're going to execute it well. <laughs> yeah, it, it drives me crazy when I talk to a leader and I go, what are you working on? Oh, I'm working on the strategy. Really? <laughs> like, what does that look like? I mean, working on the strategy is waking up, taking a shower and before you get to work and you think about it in the shower, not, you know, it's not the right. day. Um, right. Uh, it just sort of shifting that, that lens, you know, moving to hiring and, and we talked about sort of coming out of a functional role and so forth, but, and I think it, it relates to the strategy thing. Like you don't need to own strategy as a CEO, but you need to know a good one when you see it, right? You go, okay, mm -hmm. that's a good strategy. Yeah. You know, I couldn't have maybe come up with it, but that's a good one. 
Same thing on people. So we have a, a lot of cases, particularly for entrepreneurs that came out of fill in the blank, blank, engineering, marketing, accounting, sales. And now they got to hire somebody who's not in their functional role, right? And I, I see this a lot of times when they're trying to hire salespeople and they're not salespeople. They go, how, Jim, how do I hire a salesperson when I don't even know what a good one looks like? And, and I think salespeople are particularly hard because they all look good in the interview if they're any kind of yep. decent, right? So yep. how, how do you hire when it's not your specialty? So there are you know, several pieces to that that you know, all have to kind of work together. First, you know, if you're building a growing company, hiring needs to be a continuous process. Yep. I'm always looking for people. I'm always trying to find people that fit in. And a lot of times I'm going to need a power forward, but a small forward shows up and I need to grab him and figure out how to yep. play ball with him because that's the right guy available. Especially when you're a small organization, you just can't get the exact piece when you need it. So that's the first thing I'm always hiring. And sometimes I'm going to have, you know, a little bit of a mismatch and have to make do. But if I've got the right people, they're going to be, be productive. Um Second thing, I mean, my best story about hiring so, somebody. So hang on, Go talent ahead. over experience. Oh, absolutely. Well, okay, just, if, if let me let me rephrase that. Depending on what what you're hiring for, most organizations when they're hiring are hiring somebody to do a job that the organization already knows how to do. Hmm. Okay, you're hiring the third developer, you're hiring the second accountant, you're hiring the whatever. In those cases, you want talent over experience. Because it's a lot easier to train a smart young person how you want something done than to retrain somebody with experience who's mediocre. <laughs> Got it. Yep. Okay. Yep. Now, if you're trying to do something that the organization does not know how to do, right. does not have the capacity to do, I've never had a executive VP of sales. I probably want to find somebody that has experience being the executive VP of sales and tell them, here are the goals. Now, you go execute because I don't know anything about it. Right. You figure it out. So let's go back yeah. to that. How do I hire that person if I don't know a dang thing about sales? Yes. So, you know, I, I bungled in and it's kind of the, the fundamental question here is how do you identify an expert? And it's hard, but there are cues. So I did once I did uh, one year, I did 252 interviews in one year to hire 100 people. Jim, Jim's heard this story. <laughs> I haven't. I was going to ask about it later, but let's dig in it now. So you, when you were the CEO of NetQOS, you interviewed every single candidate to come into that company. Every single one. Every single one. Why? What an, because, let me just, I'll, I'll be the really extreme other side. What an incredible waste of your time. Why did you do that? <laughs> now you can respond to that. Yes. I know you don't. I know that's not the case. Because I couldn't find anything else that was more important. If I get the right team, everything else becomes easier. I always wanted to be the coach of the Olympic basketball team when they had Magic and Jordan and Bird. Because, you, you know, you roll the best five players in the world out, and then they get a little tired, you call time out, you roll the next five best players in the world. I could be a pretty mediocre coach and have a lot of success with that yeah, team, here, right? Here, here's, here's the plan, guys. Go out there and play. Questions? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and so, you know, but so many organizations spend, you know, 2% of their time recruiting, and then they spend 75% of their time managing their recruiting mistakes. And, and that's exactly what you don't want to do. So part of this process, too, if you're, you know, constantly hiring, and you got to be willing to admit your mistakes and move on quickly, yeah. too. You're going to make some mistakes. I mean, yeah, I did 252 interviews, and I got pretty good at it, but I still made some mistakes. But you've got to be able to identify those mistakes and have a management system in place that gives those people opportunities to perform. But if they don't perform, uh, move on. Uh, but kind of to the question of, but of hiring way, an expert, quick, go ahead. I think the fact that you had so many cycles, you did get really good at it. So you go, why would I take the guy who has 200, 500, 600 cycles on doing this and hand it to somebody who it's the third one they've ever done? What's the probability of good outcome between those two people, right? Yeah, and most managers, even very experienced managers, you think about it, they don't hire a lot of people during their career even. No. You, could, you could run very large organizations and have very limited 10, 20, 30 hires in your entire career. Yep. And so, yeah, I, uh, I got pretty good at it. And, and somebody, I think, I think maybe the core point, too, is somebody in the organization needs to be good at it. 
and set the bar for quality for that organization. Does this person meet the quality bar for our organization? Mm. And, and so it was me in my case. Could it be someone else in your organization? Sure. It could be an HR person or somebody that has a lot of experience hiring. But most people don't. If you leave it to your managers, they will make a lot of bad hiring. Mm. So g- given that you weren't interviewing for the technical matter, what were you interviewing for? Yeah, so I, I was interviewing for exceptionalism mm. is the way I would put it. Uh, so the story I like to tell, we, we did, I was doing all these interviews and usually I prepared a little bit, at least reviewed the resume and, and kind of thought up some things beforehand that I wanted to dig in on. But I remember my HR guy shows up at the door with a new candidate uh, and I had been back to back to back. And I'm like, I don't even know what this person's interviewing for, you know? And so I look at him and I go, you know, what are you here for? Basically? <laughs> and it was funny because she was a very, one of these people who was very detail oriented, had prepared very, uh, you know, thoroughly for the interview, was very prim and proper. And she was a little startled by that, of course. You know, she's like, uh, I'm interviewing for the PR position. Okay. At that point in my career, I had never hired a person that was just going to do public relations. So I look at her and I go, I've never hired anybody to do public relations. What makes a good PR person? Mm-hmm. Just threw it out there. She spent the next three to five minutes going from top of the you know highest level to specific techniques she thought would apply to our company and our industry and what she was going to do in the first 30, 60 days. And you know, at that point she was hired because yeah. she, she had clearly laid out that she understood deeply what a PR person was going to do in an organization. And people who are really good at something, they don't just show up at work and do that. They spend all their cycles thinking about it, Mm -hmm. right? And, you know, I tell the story of playing golf with Tom Watson. Got an opportunity to play golf with with Watson. Uh, Private jet company wanted my business. They said, hey, we'll fly you to Dallas. We'll... uh, you know, you'll play six holes with Tom Watson. We'll fly you back. You in? Okay. Twist my heart. Let me let me think about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so we we fly up there and we go in the hangar, and there's Tom Watson, and I'm mm. impressed. And you know, I'm a tennis guy by by career, but I I'm into golf. I like golf. And so there's Tom Watson, and he starts telling golf stories. And we get in the van, and Tom Watson telling golf stories. We go out on the driving range. Tom Watson talking about golf. We go play six holes. Tom Watson's talking about golf. We go back and have dinner. Tom Watson's telling golf stories. At this point, I'm wondering if this man knows anything about anything other than golf. <laughs> and, and then, of course, it hits me. You don't get to be the best golfer in the world if you spend your time thinking about a lot of other things. Yep. Right? And so, you know, back to your sales guy question, you know, you ask a sales guy, a mediocre sales guy, uh, what they're going to do, and they will give you some answer that sounds kind of like, well, you know, I just don't take no for an answer. I beat the phones. I, I have, you know, strong determination. I've never failed in any job I've had, that kind of stuff. You know, what a good sales guy says is something that sounds much more thoughtful and, and uh, exceptional. He says, I've looked at your industry. I think these are the three lighthouse customers that if we get those three customers, they'll knock down the others. So in the first 30 days, my sole mission is to get meetings with this executive at this company, this executive at this company, this executive at this company. Here's how I'm going to go about doing that. You know, and, and they, they clearly have thought about it. And uh, that's what experts sound like. Um, another thing is experts will say, I don't know. The people who are pretending will, will never use those words. Interesting. You know, I've stolen one of your ideas on interviewing and say when you ask a, a, a C player um, and it's your interview question, you go, how will I know you're doing a great job? And the C player goes, well, I'm going to show up on time. I'm going to work really hard and, you know, my desk will stay neat. You know, absolutely non applicable to the job. An A player goes, well, I suppose you're going to want to look at the, the rate of calls, the, how my funnel grows, my close ratio. If I'm clearing a million dollars a quarter, if I'm not doing that, I'm probably below the curve. But full transparent accountability to performance. By when I turn that in a little into a joke, I go, great, ask the question and then go, let me make a note of that because that's how I'm going to measure you if I hire you, right? But, right? but I think it's a fundamental difference, the willingness to be counted for transparently. I think it's a very fundamental A, B, C kind of gradation 
uh, interview question. Yeah, and they thought about, again, they thought about their yeah. profession. They treat it as a profession. They don't treat it as just, oh, this is the job that's open and it's you know close to my house and probably pays well. Do you look for exceptionalism in another area when you're interviewing? In other words, I wrote an article a while ago about hiring uh, high-level athletes, right? So college level yeah. or, or even semi-professional, that's unlikely. But you know, high-level athletes have a certain you know, discipline, focus, commitment. You know, they're, they're willing to do the work. They, you know, I, I saw a story about like a college wrestler. This dude was insane, man. He woke up at 6 o'clock in the morning. He lifted weights. He went to a couple of classes. He did workout, a couple more classes. You know, then wrestling practice, then homework, then went to bed and did it again for four years. I'm like, you want to hire that guy, right? I mean, no amount of work is going to scare him. Um, so I don't know. What do you think about exceptionalism in other areas? I picked on athletics, but there are other areas too. You yeah, no, it abso absolutely. It shows up. I mean, you know, for software developers, they, you know, have a project on the side. They're writing the next great operating system or they won some, you know, robotics contest or, or they're doing something along those lines. Yeah, we for a while, because University of Texas, of course, and I'm in Austin, uh, famous for its uh, swim program. Uh, I would occasionally see these resumes that, you know, on the other section at the very bottom would say something like, you know, set the American record in the 200 meter breaststroke or something, <laughs> you know. And you think about that for a minute. You go, you know, to set the American record in something like that that's been contested for 100 years and there are, you know, tens of thousands of people. That meant not only did you have some talent, but that meant you for like 10 years woke up every morning at 5 a.m., you know, jumped in a cold pool, swam for two hours. If you have any talent or skills whatsoever, I can probably make you successful in my organization. And so, yeah, absolutely. I think. You know, the, I'm a I'm a big fan, maybe because it's what I did. But the individual sports, particularly where you're out there on your own uh, and there's no place to hide, are you know show a lot of the kind of creative initiative uh, that you want in employees. Thanks for listening to the Lazy CEO Podcast. We'll see you next time. And be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes and check out our website, www.theceoproject.com.